Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One, the consultancy that helps companies create value from data to accelerate growth. And our guest today is Evo Rook, COO and President of Once. Once is the only provider of connectivity and software for IoT at a global flat rate, offering fast, secure, and reliable cellular connectivity and services in more than 110 countries. In this talk, we discuss the change factors in IoT adoption and in the telecommunications industry that enable the once business model to find a ready market today. And we also explored the non-technical challenges related to scaling IoT, such as business case economics, servicing costs, supply chains, and the overall need for simplicity. If you find these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, you can email us at team at iot1.com. Finally, if you have an IoT research, strategy, or training initiative that you'd like to discuss, you can email me directly at erik.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you. Evo, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Hi, Eric. Thank you. So nice to be here. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I was just in touch with um, I think it was Alexander. He um, he knows a friend of mine in Germany, uh, Marcus um, Anding, and uh, Marcus had connected us. I think it was it was probably like late 2019, and we just started chatting about what you were looking at in in China. And then COVID hit, and you know, then I've been kind of just keeping in touch with you guys uh, since, or, or monitoring it. But I'm really looking forward now to uh, this this chat with you and learning a bit more about once in your business. Yeah, likewise. I mean, uh, I've been following your platform for quite a while uh, and, and quite regularly listen to podcasts. And uh, I'm actually quite proud to be part of it now. And I hope I can contribute to your listeners. Yeah, no, I, I think this will be really an interesting conversation. And I mean, just starting with your background, I, I think there's nobody better to talk about on this topic than you. You've got this incredible background of CEO IoT for Vodafone, SVP IoT for Sprint, EVP IoT for T system, so certainly you're you're the person to talk to, and it seems like I think what was it back in 1996, at least on LinkedIn here, that was where I see your first touch point with the telco industry. What was it about uh, telco that drew you to the industry? Yeah, I mean, let's start with the end. I mean, I now uh, am the COO of Once, uh, which is a company that uh, has an, an, a very clear mission. Our mission is to really make sure that customers can use and deploy IoT sensors worldwide at a fraction of the cost that it previously was possible without compromising any quality. I'm sure we'll get into that much later, but kind of 25 years of telco, so you make me sound old, but uh, l let's call it experienced. I have really seen it all. I've worked for really big companies in that perspective. I've done wireline, I've done mobile, I've done IoT. And I always think that IoT is kind of the pinnacle of telecommunication because it combines the relevance of networking from the wireline, connecting B2B data centers, super mission critical data for customers, but it also combines um, everything from mobile. You know, mobile is a, a great technology with the potential to provide connectivity basically anywhere in the world. But when you look at how the very big companies um, commercialize that in a way, especially in mobile, it's, it's mostly domestic. And when I looked at my career and I got into IoT, I got really inspired by what our customers were doing with IoT. And they were, they were really changing the world. And they were allowing things that previously weren't happening. And the more I understood that, and the more I got inspired by it, I was like, I want to work for a company that truly enables customers to change the world for the better using this technology 
but really do it global. And the realization was that you've got big operators on the one hand who are incredibly successful, at least some of them, in IoT. And then you've got these really small companies on the other hand, and those have fascinating IT capabilities, truly brilliant global reach, but they don't have the cost base of some of the operators. And we were really thinking about combining all those assets and then create a whole new company. And now creating a new company, I didn't go that far, but I was at the time working at uh, an investor, I squared capital, and we decided to invest in once with a consortium of investors. Why? Because once in itself has many, many different components, and I believe they have the critical ingredients to address IoT very, very successfully. Now, it's a very lengthy answer, but to say I've gathered experience in telco, in wireline, mobile, and IoT, but I want to try and bring it all together and work with a company that provides a truly global capability to customers. Okay. Okay. No, very interesting to know that you were an investor. Um, and I guess that that gave you the natural touch point to get to know the management team and, and the business. You mentioned already kind of one of maybe some of the background around the question, why now? So the need for a global business that scales at a price point that's that's at least similar to domestic. Is there anything else to the why now? I mean, is it were there technological shifts that now made this business possible, whereas 10 years it wasn't possible? Or was it more of a kind of an inspired founder team that said, we see the demand kind of reaching a point where we think this can scale? You know, what is the answer to the question, why now? That's a very good question. I guess there were multiple things that were coming together. And there are two types of answers to the why now. On the one hand, why is once now growing so rapidly and why is once so successful? And then, of course, there's the component, uh, why did I now chose to join that team? Let me try and first answer it from the view from, from once the company. Yeah, Once has, an, has a very interesting vision. What one says is, we are a company, we work really hard to change the IoT industry so that our customers can change the world. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, this is fascinating. So there's something humbling in the statement that they say we work really hard because they realize that technology ultimately starts with people. And this is a very inspired team where everyone is an IoT expert. And then the second thing is, they're basically saying that they are changing the IoT supply chain, the IoT industry with new technology, with new commercial models, with doing things differently so that customers can actually take the benefit from that because they are the ones that are actually changing the world. And I thought that was very refreshing because it's a realization that the actual use case sits with the end customers and not with the ones who are providing the IoT services. And and why does that answer your why now question? For me, it was both refreshing and inspiring to see that there is a company that realizes, A, the supply chain had to be challenged, Number two, that they were taking it initially from a cost model. And then number three, when we were looking as investors at the business, we also saw that they actually have a really solid margin. We're like, wow, this is going to properly scale. And quite frankly, when I saw all of that, I just wanted to be part of it. And and we're doing it right now. And it's fascinating. I mean, I'm, I'm almost a year at the company. And the more I learn about it, the more I learn about the vision of the founder, the, 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 the execution of our CTO, Eunice, who is a, a brilliant but also a very passionate IoT expert, and the confidence that we get from our investors. But most important, we're winning more than 300 customers a month digitally online. And we have customers that, of course, we uh, win uh, through direct sales. And we're doing three times the revenue this year, and we're going to go three times again next year. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. Wow. Yeah, no, that's an incredible growth record. And it's what it was in 2017 that the business was established. Am I, am I getting that right? I mean, it's still quite a young business. It's a beautiful, it's not a story. It's, it's, it's a very good track record of having a simple vision, 
ruthlessly executing it, but making sure that when you are, with all respect, but still a smaller company, you always need to take care of three things. Number one, you have to make sure that you're providing a solution to an actual problem. Yeah, If you need to look for customers and you can't convince them within 30 seconds, you're probably not onto something. And you got to be honest to yourself about that. And, and once has that. Then number two is your technology should never be just a stitched together network of vendors. Yeah, you have to keep yourself honest. You have to develop your own stuff. Why is that? Because you need to keep your independence. You need to keep your cost under control and you need to control your own scalability. And then number three, boring as it may sound, it's also mission critical. You need to build a financial structure of the company that balances financial interest to keep your, you know, your yourself honest on the fundamentals, but also with strategic investors that help you go faster because they can either help you on the cost side or they can help you on the on the demand side by buying also services from you. And, and once it's done that very cleverly, they've always balanced the financial concept with strategic investors and really good execution. Yeah, got it. Yeah, and I can see you guys are on a tear right now. I mean, I, Crunchbase obviously doesn't have all the, the data in the world, but it looks like you guys are raising a, another round every, uh, every five or six months. So obviously financing this type of growth is that's an effort in itself. But I'm really looking forward to getting into the business model, into the tech stack. Before we go there, let's start simple. Let's talk about your, your customers and your value proposition. So you mentioned you have uh, 300 customers coming online. So that makes me feel like uh, you're able to work with smaller companies that can place orders. Uh, and then you know, I'm sure you have kind of larger enterprise accounts as well. So who are they? And then what's your value proposition to these customers? Yeah, let, let's start about the customers from ones first. They have one thing in common, and that is that most of our customers are found and served 100% digitally. And that goes for really small customers and really large customers. One of the beauties of the ONCE model is that we basically all serve them the same. Because in IoT, you never know who is a small customer uh, and who is a big customer because some of the smaller companies are some of your largest users and the other way around. So we have more than 7,000 customers in total and we win about 300 customers online each month. Now, when you uh, talk about the value proposition, if I were to say it very simple and, and very quick, we allow our customers to deploy and manage a connected sensor anywhere in the world for 10 years for 10 euros or $10 if you're in the US. We're expanding that now also to be available to Asian customers. So we were a European company until two years ago. We started expanding last year and this year we have gone from Europe to being present all around the USA, all around Asia, and we're moving into Latin soon as well. The value prop therefore is the ability to manage a sensor deployed anywhere in the world for a dollar a year, bought and sold and serviced throughout the world. So you need to be truly global with having technicians all around the world and the ability to manage that device for 10 years. So there's a lot of focus always on the cost and the data. But what we always say is it's not just the data routing. It is the ability to deploy and manage over a timeline of 10 years for a very low cost. And we also pointed out to our customers, we have to be in a position to do that and make a margin. Because if we wouldn't be making a margin, then our model wouldn't be scalable. And I tell you, we deploy this and for a dollar a year, we still make a very solid margin. Okay. Yeah, it's a brilliant model because, I mean, probably, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, 
anything that was being connected to cellular would be a fairly significant hardware investment. And now we're talking, I mean, we're connecting things that cost dollars, right? Uh, devices that cost dollars, maybe tens of dollars. And so the cost is, in many cases, it's not the device. The cost is all of the, you know, it's deploying the device. It's maintaining the device. It's maintaining connectivity to the device. And, and these are all the things that it sounds like you guys are simplifying, right? So no need to go and, and change, uh, kind of change cellular. No need to kind of have that, that labor uh, overhead um, that, you know, that used to be a smaller fraction. Now is, is often a, the larger fraction of the total cost of a solution. I mean, am I kind of reading that correctly, or how do you view kind of the value of this, the the cost structure, let's say, behind your component of the total cost of a customer deploying a solution versus the other things, the hardware and the software that they're deploying on the device? You're you're actually spot on. As a matter of fact, um, our company is called Once for that very reason. We're kind of obsessed with avoiding a second truck roll for your network. And uh, we, uh, we really say... The sensor should only be deployed once in its lifetime. And when you think about that, that means you need to have data for the lifetime of that device available to route to and from that device. The device itself needs to be active for 10 years, and you need to be able to communicate with that device. And those are many components, but our our philosophy is really deploy once. Yeah. Now, there's multiple ways to, to try and get to that, um, that outcome. But it also needs to be economic. And when you think about the business case for IoT, there's three components. So you kind of mentioned it. There's, there's the hardware. Now, let's put the hardware to the side for the moment. It's still quite expensive, but it's getting much better. Some issues at the moment in the supply chain of chips, clearly. But the device is pretty much the same to everyone. There are two big components. One is uh, mostly overestimated and the other one is underestimated. There's software and connectivity. And when you connect on a cellular network, everybody is always obsessed with the cost of data. But actually, for most IoT use cases, the cost of the software and the IT associated with having a SIM live are actually higher than the cost of the routing of the data. Let me try and explain. A cellular network has always been provided by operators. Now, operators have never built cellular networks with IoT in mind. And good on them. Uh, They've done it for phones. It's brilliant technology. The world would not be the same if they did not support the smartphones. So operators have built these networks for phones. That, however, has two disadvantages. One is that the average revenue per phone per month is around 20 euro when you're in uh, in Europe and about $40 when you're in the USA and somewhere in between that in Asia. Now, when you build a network and you anticipate that every connection rent is anywhere north of 20, south of $40 a month, clearly you have a certain cost associated with that as well. And then the second thing is, Operators are domestic players. They monetize their domestic ownership of the spectrum that they bought through the auctions. The problem with IoT is, first of all, it doesn't generate 20 to $40 in revenue per month per device. You're lucky if you were to you know, uh, generate a, you know, a dollar. In our case, a dollar a year. But the IT cost of being an operator and having a registered SIM inside an operator are already five to six dollars a year. Why is that? They report the amount of connections to the street on a, on a quarterly basis. So that kind of makes it an auditable connection. They have lawful intercept, E911 compliance, all kinds of relevant IT cost of billing for operators are massive. And of course, they have much higher GNA being the big companies that they are. So operators, they have economic advantage on the network side, on their own network, but IoT is a global business. And it means that more than 70% of the you know, revenue sit outside their networks, which is basically arbitrage on the wholesale market. And then they have the much higher IT cost. You combine all of that, then you see that operators have network advantage at home, but they lose that abroad. 
and they have a disadvantage on the IT. Then you have virtual operators, virtual IoT companies. They have the advantage of the lower IT cost, smaller companies, cloud-based, and, and, and. But they have the disadvantage that they have to buy their connectivity from all the operators. And this is what I believe kind of the secret sauce of once is they build a company where they can actually, the courtesy of investors like SoftBank and Deutsche Telekom in our company, they can buy network capacity all around the world as an operator. And they have the low cost of IT as a complete cloud-based digital company. Combine those two things, they are what we call, once is an IoT operator. Very low cost of data and incredibly low cost of IT. And that allows us to deploy a sensor anywhere in the world for 10 years for 10 bucks. Okay, yeah, fascinating background. I think it's it's always you know, very interesting to understand why a younger company and how a younger company is able to build a cost structure that an older company, or let's say a legacy market leader, simply can't build, right? And it's not because they don't have the resources, and, and, and often it's not necessarily because they don't have the vision, right? Um, but it's because they have a legacy business that has a certain, stru- you know, a certain structure. Um, and uh, this is a fascinating case study, I think, in, um, in building a business that simply couldn't be built by, you know, a legacy company. And obviously, they've recognized this and and seen you as a, a great investment and a great partner. Um, let's make this a bit more tangible on the use case side. So we've already crossed off mobile. You're, you're not going to be my mobile service provider, although I would I would love that. Um, um, I guess some things like um, street cameras probably are not going to be on the list as well. So streaming video data, you know, I think that would kill your cost structure. I'm sure there's I mean there's got to be a tremendous long tail of use cases or different you know product categories that are using the ones network but maybe we can cherry pick a couple of the more common uh, categories what would be a great use case for once yeah uh, by the way let me uh uh correct one thing we actually do have use cases with cameras and they work really well i'll try and explain that obviously not at completely the same price point but close to it Um, Now, there's multiple use cases. Um, What matters, of course, for us is that most of our customers are truly global companies. What I like to mention uh, are smaller companies that are big suppliers in smart cities and smart lighting. Uh, There's a smaller company, it's actually a company out of Romania, that have built their IoT solution completely integrated onto our platform that allows them to turn city lights into smart city lights. And because they have embedded our connectivity as a component into the what they call TCU, the Telecom Control Unit. It allows them to capitalize it. It allows their customers to capitalize it. So what their, their customers are buying is a smart device that is fitted to a light bulb that actually turns a, with all respect, dumb light into a smart light. And those are solutions that are being su- you know supplied to the largest of cities in the world. Even the capital of the US will soon be using this solution, which is fascinating and we're clearly quite proud of. The ingredients are very interesting. Number one, complete integration between our platform and our customer. Number two, this customer is supplying connectivity towards their end customer as a component of their hardware. So for them, the unit is connected. Their customer doesn't have to worry about that. And number three, single SKU globally available anywhere in the world. Then we have fleet companies, fleet companies who have some of the complexities that they deploy devices into cars that sometimes when it is in in, in the use cases, for example, to track uh, vehicles if they were stolen and so on, clearly it's not clear where these devices are in the car. They need to be hidden. So they deploy them in the car, but the car changes, owner goes for 10 years and then end. How do you stay in touch with the device over 10 years when there's multiple 
uh, owners and, and so on. So they're rebuilding their business model based on our technology with the notion that that device, whatever happens, will always be contactable over 10 years, even if the, the, the car changes hands. And they can remotely change the data packages and the use cases on those devices. And that kind of brings me to my challenge to you that actually, as long as it's CCTV, so it doesn't break the bank in terms of high throughput, we also have camera solutions. Because while we're well known for the 10 for 10, we actually allow our customers to build their own data packages, completely automated top ops, so they can build tariffs that vary duration of how long they want a device to be active. We always say they need to have a duration that is longer than the economic life cycle of the device they deploy, higher or lower data packages, and then a combination of preloaded data packages and automatic top-ups. I'd like to think actually that our IT solution is even more relevant than our ability to have low-cost data. The customers that, for example, work in AWS, they can see, activate, manage, deactivate, top up, change data tariffs on their own deployed devices through their AWS suite because we're deeply integrated with them. I mean, there's multiple ways to go about this, but in the end, what is very important, and this is kind of our, our guiding engineering principle, our services need to be as consumable as software. So downloadable, configurable, click and add and switch on and off, always through software, digitally. It needs to be reliable as electricity, which basically means everywhere in the world. But we also say it needs to be as consistent as software and electricity, which basically means it needs to work the same anywhere where you are. Interesting. Yeah. And so obviously a lot of IoT devices don't have proper user interfaces. So just to understand more of this point that you mentioned, uh, global connectivity, and is it kind of pull the device out of the box and the user activates it in some way and then it's active? What does that user journey typically look like for, let's say, an industrial device that doesn't have a kind of a proper user interface? It could be used by somebody in China, it could be used by somebody in Ethiopia, so you can have language barriers, et cetera. And you need that, I mean, that simplicity is the value proposition, right? Of just one SKU uh, globally for a, a device that doesn't have a front end. Yeah, you, you clearly know your way around IoT picking those examples, but uh, those are exactly the challenges we're solving. As a matter of fact, we look at ourselves as a supply chain company. Repeating, uh, we say we work really hard to change the IoT industry, but what we really say is the IoT supply chain so that our customers can change the world. Now, it's since we have built this company with a myopic focus on IoT. We've actually disrupted the supply chain of IoT. Let's start with that unpack experience um, and the activation deactivation. It's actually interesting, but there is no need for a SIM to ever to be offline. So this whole notion of having to activate a SIM, we've actually removed that complexity out of the supply chain. Our SIMs are always active. Uh, it's one of the differences, advantages, if you'd so like, between us and operators. Um, I totally understand why operators cannot keep all of their SIMs active all the time. For starters, as what I said earlier, they report on the amount of active uses they have on a monthly basis, and therefore they cannot keep a SIM online while there's no usage on it. We do not have that disadvantage, and we've exploited that. So for us, a SIM is already active even when we ship it, which allows our customer to actually see the device immediately. They do not have to go through an activation uh, sequence, which, as you may probably know from phones, can, can actually be a bit clunky. No, so they, they bring them, so either they put the, the, the SIM directly in the device themselves, or we have a very good partnership with a company that does all of our logistics everywhere. Again, what we said, you keep it simple, keep it consistent, do things the same everywhere in the world, deep IT integration. And what we can do is, for example, when a customer in the US is uh, using uh, devices 
that are actually built in, 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 in Vietnam or in Taiwan or in China, um, we actually ship directly to where they are building their devices because the, dev- the SIM is already active. They use the active SIM to be testing the SIM in those facilities so that they go into the device. The device then gets shipped to the end customer. It is already working, and the customer can actually track it already when it's on their way over to them. And these are maybe small things, the always-on component, that actually simplify managing an IoT supply chain materially for our customers. I'm curious, this is just a little bit of a curiosity here, but... If I'm imagining that, that there's a factory in Vietnam, they have the device uh, deployed, um, it's already been activated, um, they ship it, goes on a container, lands in the port of Los Angeles, and then eventually it makes its way into the hands of somebody in Columbus, Ohio. Um, as it switches from network to network, are you, I mean, is this becoming kind of a track and trace? So you can say uh, it's it's left Vietnam, the port, it's arrived here. I mean, are they are, are they able to use the fact that it's connected and that it's kind of switching networks as a supply chain track and trace uh, solution as well? Um, they could. Um, obviously, this is the customer's data, so it's their mm-hmm. data, and they need to decide whether or not they want to start reading the device as early as it uh, arrives at their factory or, you know, when they choose when they start looking at it. Um, to go into real specifics, obviously, when customers have preloaded the 10 years of um, uh, the ability to exchange data with the device, um, some t- customers have actually five months in their own supply chain. So they and they don't want to go uh, to let that go off the ten years that they could be using it in the field and deploying it with their end customers. So then we agree at what we call a supply chain grace period. It's it's these type of discussions that I believe are so important. Yeah, of course everybody knows our ten for ten, but what I said to you earlier, it's our vision actually that customers come to us not so much for the 10 for 10, of course they need like that, but it's about the flexibility about the IT, the supply chain, the logistics integration, and our true ability to accommodate their supply chain. As a matter of fact, we are updating in that perspective our strategy. Um, Previously, um, once was well known for for the 10 for 10, um, what we are building right now, and all of this is going to go live this year, is you will hear us talk about once with once connect, which is the 10 for 10, once OS, which is our software proposition with multiple tools that allow our customers to manage a device from birth all the way to recollection. It's by the way, one of them, and we could once have a topic on it. It's, an, it's a not yet so well understood, but going to be a problem, my, my words, in the supply chain of IoT, is IoT device retrievals. I mean, at this moment, millions, billions of devices are being deployed in hard-to-reach places. Those contain precious metals. Those contain plastics. Those contain all kinds of things. Who's going to retrieve them? How are you going to do that? And I anticipate that big companies deploying these millions of devices are going to be held accountable for that. So what we're providing are software tools from the birth of the device all the way to their last moment and in between that help our customers manage the supply chain. And then our third um, uh, service that we're launching is basically our platform business. Interesting, you've mentioned it at the start, more and more operators are realizing that for them to play a global role in IoT, they need to change the cost base of having a global IoT proposition. Uh, Running it on their domestic network, just leaning on their roaming rates and then having a very heavy over-the-top domestic deployed IoT platform with typical vendors, it's just not economic for them. And they're starting to lose uh, business towards the more agile, smaller companies, the MVNOs for which for whom I have a lot of respect. It basically is the following is happening in the world. Any IoT use case where the software costs are higher than the network cost, at this moment, MVNOs 
have better cards than operators. And therefore what you see is that more and more operators are actually interesting to cooperate with us, us being their distributor, even including connectivity of an IoT system, allowing them to have the same low-cost offering in their portfolio. So once going forward has three main product lines. Once Connect, that is our lifeblood. Once OS, which are software tools. And the Once Platform, available to operators to exploit it, to build their own portfolios. Okay, interesting. So maybe we can go a bit deeper then into the network side. So if I understand correctly, and and maybe I don't, but... um, You have partnerships in something like 180 countries, so most of the countries in the world, with telco operators that have a presence there, like SoftBank in Japan, and you're kind of using their their bandwidth for your, you know, to to create the Ones network. You know, first of all, is that kind of is that correct? Is that every time you go into a country, you have a partnership with one or more telco operators there, and that's how you are able to serve in that country? And then the second question would be, is that separate from this? point that you just mentioned of, of telco operators using the ones platform so are, is it that they're also then building other services that they're directly selling but using your technology as the uh, kind of as the back end there yes i i can't go in too many details but i can give you the the theory behind it um, and the practice uh, so on, on your first question how do we do it um, we've got a very strong a partner in Deutsche Telekom who have invested at the very beginning into ONCE as what they call controlled disruption. So they were fascinated by the idea and they've been a brilliant partner to us because on the one hand they challenge us, uh, but on the other hand they also have given us a, a, a SIM property that allows us to uh, deliver services in 140 countries in the world. Um, but um, everybody who is in IoT knows that with a single SIM property, you're not going to be flexible enough. So we've added a partnership um, in China to be able with a local uh, operator to also deliver services in China. Um, We are extending that local capability to include some of the more relevant but complicated countries in the world. Uh, where you need to have local established relationships with one or multiple operators. Uh, Typical countries include Turkey, India, but also Brazil, which we think is a very attractive market. And then we have a new equity uh, participation. As a matter of fact, you said at the very beginning, it looks like we're doing a round every month. We actually done one very well organized, very big round with multiple tickets uh, uh, investing into ones. So we have strategic investors and financial investors. So the financial investors, I squared capital and the soft bank investment fund. But then quite rapidly thereafter came the strategic investors with Deutsche Telekom increasing their stake and the soft bank operator stepping into ones. And that allows us initially to deliver our services, including connectivity towards the like of soft bank Obviously, we use the SoftBank network in Japan, but also others. But to build together with SoftBank an extension of our footprint. And that's kind of the recipe that we follow is strong partnerships with operators because we realize that they are very important in uh, in IoT because they do supply the networks. But then to also give them an opportunity to benefit from our low IT costs. So the negotiations go a little bit like you give us access to a country, we give you access to the world. And it almost literally is the negotiation that then takes place. And now we have a number of other operators who basically say, okay, we give you very good conditions to access my territory. But in exchange for that, I want to be able to have your portfolio in my portfolio. And we're signing those deals quite regularly now. A country for the world. That's a simple way of saying it. I like that. Yeah. Well, let me just ask one last question here. And maybe there's also a couple other things you'd like to cover. But you are, on the one hand, a, a relatively young company. On the other hand, already a fairly uh, you know, sophisticated company uh, in terms of your portfolio and your, your partnership model. You're also in an, in an area that's you know evolving very rapidly. You have NB-IoT from, from satellites coming online. You have 5G. You have edge computing, et cetera. So there's a lot 
of other things going on in this space. Can you share at whatever level you, you feel comfortable your vision for the future? If we look forward five years, if we look forward 10 years into the future, what do you see once evolving into? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, first of all, in IoT, one can get lost chasing the next thing. I've, I always challenge our teams a little bit, just the sheer fact that we develop something new doesn't make mean that we made progress. So um, the philosophy we'd like to keep in once is to stay focused on where our strengths are and not to chase every new um, phenomena inside IoT. So you got to make your choices. So if, if I were to make it... You know, simplify an incredibly complicated world into two main streams uh, that I see. Number one is universal connectivity, and number two is um, hyperlocal. And what do I mean? And those two are not; those are mutually exclusive, actually. So on the one hand, you've got a lot of developments fascinating with AI, low latency, 5G, autonomous cars, incredible things in robotics. You've actually done an, uh, uh, a podcast on that recently. It's a fascinating one with, with AI and robotics. But to be frank, as much as I love that world, that's not for us. This super high bandwidth with super low latency with the fascinating uh, edge cases, they are domestic at this moment in the involvement of the, the technology. So I think those are best addressed by operators who are committing billions to 5G. What we focus on is what we call universal connectivity. You know, our ambition, as I said earlier, is our services need to be consumed as software reliable as electricity and as consistent as software and electricity. Now, in this universal connectivity, global supply chain simplification needs to happen. We believe, for example, that it's actually a an, an highly inconsistent thing that our supply chain in IoT, in the industry, is actually not very efficient. It's actually not as digital as you would want it to be. It's kind of ironic. We are digitizing supply chain of our customers, but if you look at the supply chain of IoT itself, it's actually not so digital. Uh, let me give you a case in point. We're still shipping plastic SIMs. I mean, when you think about it, how crazy is that? We're shipping plastic SIMs that contain a chip that are going to be chucked into devices that have plenty of chips available that could easily host the credentials that we put on our chip. So we're embracing EUICC, but we don't believe EUICC is going far enough. We actually, at some point, want to eradicate the complete physical shipping out of our supply chain. So that's one thing, thing for the future that we're investing a lot of time and uh, in partnership money on. Then... We really believe that software tools are very important up and above connectivity. So we're investing in our Once OS, which basically gives uh, customers the ability, for example, to save battery cost or battery performance through the means of software. One of the biggest considerations for our customers is how long will my device work on a single battery load, not in the laboratory, but deployed in real life. And what we see is that there's a bit of an over-promised under-deliver, almost uh, similar to electric cars. When you read the mileage in the folder when you buy it, and when you start driving, you rarely achieve it. Well, the same goes for IoT battery power devices. So we're providing tools to use software protocol optimization to allow our customers to optimize the battery usage when the device is either communicating or pulling data and so on. And we achieve fascinating results, 17% as a minimum, but up to 60% battery improvement using our software. So we believe these are highly relevant tools to be deployed by our customers. So this is also an area where we invest. And then lastly, universal communications also means blending different network bearers, narrowband, CATM, LTE, satellite, and more adjacency, but more fluid integration between LoRa and Narrowband and so on. So this is also an area where we invest a lot of our time and capabilities in. Okay, great. Yeah, I love that focus. 
and, uh, and certainly that market space is going to keep you busy. So that'll be a, a niche, but a very, very large niche. So uh, plenty to do there. Yeah, we couldn't grow faster than we're growing right now. I mean, uh, at this moment, our, our growth is actually based by the ability to hire the best possible people. And we have... Uh, one of the biggest advantages of ones is we, uh, and, and all kudos go to the people that were there way before me. When you see what Eunice and Alex have built in Riga, this development center that we have in IoT with, with, with very talented software developers. We're now also building a development center in Uruguay to be sure that we are mitigated of not only having software development in one part of the world. Um, so now we have one in another part in the world. The the real, real credit goes to those people who build our own capabilities and allow us to be an independent player with our own software at low cost, high flexibility. And then we just need to focus it. Yeah, we our, our real strength at this moment is to be one of the truly global players. That's why... We now have offices in Miami, we have offices in Tokyo, we're opening in Singapore, we are all around Europe, clearly. We're going to go to uh, Europe right where they are already. We're looking uh, at potentially going into Sao Paulo, um, and we're just getting started. Yeah, great. Well, maybe that's a good, uh, good place for me to ask you how folks could get in touch, because we certainly have plenty of potential customers uh, listening, but I think we also have a lot of people that could be either joining the team or exploring how to partner with ONCE. So what's the best way from these different perspectives for people to learn more and, and then potentially to get in touch with the ONCE team? We have, uh, again, here we make choices. We have chosen LinkedIn. Um, you could argue if that was the right choice or not, because quite frankly, LinkedIn, um, I don't know anymore if it is for business context or just for advertising, but um, we have a well-maintained LinkedIn page where people will see our job openings, regular updates on our technology. So that's the most powerful source. Ultimately, what I always tell people, if you want to be part of making sure that IoT becomes a global optimized supply chain that allow many, many super clever companies to change the world for the better, then come and join us. We're always looking for people. Uh, here's our hiring philosophy. We hire for confidence. But in our world, confidence can only come out of two sources, preferably from both. Experience, so that people are you know, not doing it for the first time, and expertise, so they really know what they're talking about. We always look for people that are confident based on experience and expertise. This is our vision. I mean, we believe IoT can scale. IoT should scale. We have removed the cost barrier. We are removing supply chain issues. We're optimizing through software whether that is battery management or being able to pinpoint where a device is without having to use GPS. But we're also conscious um, that security needs to be addressed. So we're making investments on uh, SIM identity. We can already identify a SIM in AWS. I actually thought you did a very interesting podcast with Roy, the, 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 I believe he's the CEO of Security Things. I mean, as much as I don't want security to stand in our way, we have to be conscious that it does. And for those who are interested in, in, in scaling, then, then you should listen to that podcast. We're also using a lot of technology to make sure that security is an enabler, not, not a service that we sell, but we're, we're obviously putting it into the DNA of our products. Yeah, no, that's an important point. Uh, so security and also um, privacy, I mean, you mentioned the convenience of a, a device being able to change hands from one owner to another, but then obviously that introduces some privacy um, uh, you know, challenges. I mean, just there's a management challenge that the uh, device provider then needs to figure out as, as ownership shifts and then uh, data access shifts with that, uh, that ownership. But I imagine these things are, are, are areas that you're working on with partners and, and uh, enabling through your um, through your platform and your OS? Yeah, we have to. I mean, uh, when you think about ones on the one hand, we're super simple, yeah, 10 for 10. <laughs> Everybody can remember that. But that actually, but th what it means is we provide IoT lifetime connectivity. Well, that's a big thing to say. Yeah? It's an even harder thing to do. 
But that's what we we love. That's what drives us. I love it. Our customers are are, are uniquely surprised, but all of our employees are super motivated because we're actually very proud that we can say we provide to our customers lifetime IoT services. There's not a lot of companies who can say that. It also gives you an enormous obligation and an enormous responsibility. And that's why we're continuing to invest in software. Yeah, no, it's a powerful vision. And as you continue to, to exceed, you know, succeed on this vision, I think this would be a very good thing for the industry as a whole, right? We need uh, we need simplicity uh, as much as we need anything, right? Uh, in terms of moving the industry forward. Uh, but uh, Ivo, I think we've given um, quite a, a, a kind of broad and deep overview of, of once and, and the, the space that you're operating in. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that's important for folks to understand? I think we covered a lot. I would just say, never try and understand everything in one call or in one question. Um, you know, I'm, I'd like to say to everybody, also the, the audience, you know, stay curious, stay curious about this industry. If you're curious about ones, get in touch with us. Um, and, but, but also see technology as a tool. Yeah, I don't know what it is because big tech always sounds like it's become a purpose. Frankly, it's not. It's tool. You know, one of the most universal languages in the world nowadays is coding. And with coding, you can do incredible things. But let's just make sure that we focus on what really matters, and that is to improve physical life for our planet, for our people, uh, for, for, you know, doing good stuff. Um, being inclusive, uh, developing use cases that actually help us use a little bit less natural resources. That's the stuff that really matters. And ultimately, tech is not a purpose. Tech is a tool to make that happen. If we all become a little bit more digital, we all become a little bit more efficient. I'd like to think we've just done all a little bit enough to make this place a better place. Yeah, great. Well, that's a great thought to end on. Uh, Ivo, thank you again. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot and uh, hopefully back sometime. Absolutely. Let's talk in a year or two. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.